Authors whose books get published in this series have the best of both worlds. They get a regular printed book that they can give to their promotion and tenure committees, their friends and their families, and that the press also can send out to review media that are as yet still reluctant to assign people to review books just online. While anyone in the entire world with internet access can consult their book, read it all for free online, or assign chapters to students at no charge, thus expanding their readership exponentially beyond the number who could find a copy in a few hundred academic libraries, mostly in the US. What scholar would not want to have a printed book to put on the shelf and at the same time have it exposed to readers all over the world at no cost to those readers? This is, I think, the wave of the future, if it proves financially feasible. Whether it will do so remains to be seen. The early evidence seems to indicate that we can sell almost as many books in POD form through this site as we did the regular offset printed books from the series that was published during the 1990s. We had expected and results have shown that with the availability of the books in this series in either cloth or paperback formats from the outset, sales of the cloth edition would not likely exceed 100 copies. University presses had come to learn that by the late 1990s, more academic libraries were instructing their vendors to fill orders with paperbacks if published simultaneously. And many of our presses had therefore adapted by delaying publication of a paperback by a year or more. In this way, we could still sell three to 400 copies of a book in hardback, a sufficiently large number that we could also have this run printed by traditional offset, since printers using that technology had reduced their prices in competition with the new digital printers. While using digital printing for the second stage of a book's life cycle in paperback until sales drop low enough to put the book into Lightning Source's pure POD system. We don't as yet know, however, how low we can go with paperback sales until we reach the point of no return. Experimenting with different pricing schemes is one of the aims of our Romance Study series, and we use the opportunity provided by a near perfect test case with two early books in this series, both about women writers in 19th century France by authors of the same academic rank published within a month of each other to see if differences in the cost between the hardback and paperback editions, that is the differential between the two prices, would affect sales very much. It didn't make a huge difference, but interestingly, the book that had the higher list price for the hardback and the lower list price for the paperback outsold the other in both formats. Uh, the book priced at 65 in hardback and 25 in paperback sold 85 in hardback and 308 in paperback, while the book priced at 39 in hardback and 30 in paperback sold 64 in hardback and 143 in paperback. So the real surprise there, of course, not surprising that the, uh, the cheaper book in paperback sold more, but that the uh, more expensive book in hardback also sold more. Uh, maybe a librarian has an explanation for that, but I don't know. It's a mystery. But we also realize that there must be an upper limit to the pricing of a paperback before its sales are harmed. We just don't know yet quite where that limit is. But when you consider back in the 1960s, university presses were able to sell regularly about 3,000 copies of books just in hardback, or almost every book. And then even in the mid-1990s, we were still able to sell 200 or more hardbacks simultaneously with eight or 900 paperbacks. It is rather amazing that we are still in business when sales for a typical monograph now, even when the paperback is delayed, are about three to 400 hardbacks and not more than about four to 500 paperbacks on average. The numbers are getting so low that every extra efficiency we can muster will not suffice to stave off the inevitable, barring some new technological innovation that can come to our rescue once again. And as we all should know by now, trying to turn ourselves into many, many random houses is not the answer. Just ask all those presses whose budgets were devastated this year by massive returns from the cash-strapped bookstores. Open access in its most full-blown form where there are no copyright or other restrictions on reuse of academic work of any kind, except under the most popular Creative Commons license, commercial use, whatever that means, will come about only if universities decide to step up to the plate and move to gold OA for monographs as they seem to be beginning to do for journal articles. Gold OA is um, as distinguished from green OA, which means essentially self-archiving. Gold OA is essentially providing for open access by paying all the costs up front. Um, it's a common terminology when you talk about open access these days. <clears throat> now, uh, just recently, uh, a group of universities announced a so-called compact for open access publication 
uh, whereby Cornell, Dartmouth, Harvard, MIT, and UC Berkeley committed themselves, quote, to the timely establishment of dural mechanisms for underwriting reasonable publication fees for open access journal articles written by its faculty for which other institutions would not be expected to provide funds, unquote. This is, of course, just a promissory note to be redeemed at some future point when these universities, perhaps joined then by others, actually do set up such durable mechanisms. But at least it is a step in the right direction and constitutes a recognition of the responsibility for universities to assume this burden at an institutional level and not just let each faculty member fend for himself or herself in paying the required fees. Another key term in this compact is reasonable. One wonders who gets to define what is reasonable as a fee for any given journal and how that is determined, especially in the absence of knowledge of the real cost the publisher incurs. There is, I should note, not unanimous agreement that this is a step in the right direction, however. Stefan Harnad, an outspoken advocate for Green OA, thinks this is the wrong direction to move at this time and that Green OA should logically precede Gold OA. Even if you take $3,500 as an emerging norm for an OA publication fee for a journal article based on the experience of the Public Library of Science journals, this is still a far cry from the $20,000 to $25,000 that it would cost to fully subsidize publication of a typical monograph, assuming that the costs associated with print publication amount to no more than 25% of the overall cost of publishing the book with this amount, that is twenty dollars to $25,000, being the first copy cost alone. So far, I've seen no evidence of any university willing to take this leap from subsidizing OA faculty publishing in journals to OA faculty publishing in books. There is one exception, not in this country, but in Canada, the University of Athabasca, which has set up a press to do open access publishing. And uh, everybody's really interested in how they're doing that, but they got a ton of money to do it, and so far, so good. That is unfortunate as what I call the new digital divide between book and journal content will only grow wider as more of the latter is made available open access while only a trickle of the former gets into that mode. In what sense does it make intellectually to have these two forms of scholarship so separated from each other in cyberspace? Well, none. What is happening is that there are more experiments with getting monographs into online systems beyond those established by commercial entities with, that, with the first on the scene like Net Library, eBrary, Questia, My iLibrary, and so forth. And then later, the ebook reader platforms that are beginning to extend well beyond the Kindle and Sony readers. And even Oxford Scholarship Online, which was a pioneering effort among university presses to break the logjam for getting books in the digital arena. In recent months, there have been announcements by JSTOR in cooperation with UC Berkeley and the Humanities eBook Project of intentions to open their operations to become suppliers of large aggregations of eBooks. Also, Project Muse has begun a pilot project to test the feasibility of bringing monographs into its operation and making them integrated with the journal content already available there. Meanwhile, five university presses have succeeded in persuading the Mellon Foundation to provide seed money to explore yet another cooperative nonprofit venture in this arena. While Duke has now moved beyond beta testing of its online monographs program using eBrary's technology for its platform into full operational mode. Um, you might note, by the way, that the Mellon Foundation is behind almost all of these. I don't think they had a role in Dukes, but they were, of course, the, the creator of JSTOR, the creator of uh, the uh, Humanities eBook Project, the creator of Project Muse. And um, in a recent conversation with the, uh, the, the heads of the Humanities eBook Project, they too wondered why Mellon was going around setting up all these competing operations when it would seem to make sense to bring them all together into kind of one large enterprise, but who knows the mysterious ways in which the Mellon Foundation works. All of these proposed schemes, however, are simply nonprofit variations of their commercial counterparts, and they all depend on the subscription model to sustain themselves, so none is truly open access. More promising along these lines is the scholar-initiated Open Humanities Press, which a month ago announced the launching of five new open access monograph series in critical and cultural theory the technical support of the University of Michigan Library's Scholarly Publishing Office, which functions very much the way our Office of Digital Scholarly Publishing does at Penn State. It is also at Michigan, of course, that the university rather dramatically announced that its press would in the future publish monographs online, misleading some to believe that the press would no longer provide any of its book in print form, whereas in fact what Michigan intends to do, as I understand it, is what we have already been doing with our Romance Studies series for four years in what Michigan's own press had already been doing for its digital culture book series. 
but give, give credit to Michigan for pushing the envelope. Some of us presses would prefer to have more evidence of this approach's economic feasibility before taking the full plunge with our entire list. But if the Michigan administration is willing to put its money where its mouth is and support this venture even if losses mount, more power to it. Eventually, Michigan may find that it's just not worth the effort to maintain a market mechanism at all for cost recovery and just try going OA completely. And I think the, uh, whatever happens at University of Athabasca Press will be very revealing in this regard. And also to link up to something I said earlier, the University of Athabasca Press is actually um, a test site for this uh, open monograph press software that uh, is being developed by the Public Knowledge Project. And there's a, a very interesting article I encourage all of you to look up in the uh, February issue of the Journal of Electronic Publishing by John Walensky, who's been one of the leaders in this field. It's called Toward the Design of an Open Monograph Press, which takes you through um, what this kind of software can do. And um, it adds two very interesting stages to the normal process of what we in, in uh, publishing think of as, as the publishing process where it uh, up front it incorporates an incubation uh, phase as a possible alternative where you can use web 2.0 technologies to experiment with the possibility of something becoming a book which might have arisen out of a paper delivered at a conference or something written uh, for some symposium or whatever but they the idea here is to to create the kind of buzz around this and to help the author decide whether this is going to be a book and to feed ideas to the author so they might actually create the book. And then at the end stage, um, the system builds into it a another Web 2.0 um, sort of community of readers so that after a book gets published, it gets linked up into all sorts of discussion networks whereby you know, the book is not just isolated and sort of hidden in the stacks in a library, it becomes a living, breathing entity that then you know, has, a, has a life of its own and potentially can go through various revisions and form a whole you know, network of people who are working along these lines. So that's a very exciting uh, part of this whole software system. So I think you know, if it's developed, I think a lot of uh, presses indeed uh, will be eager to adopt it. I'm encouraging my own press to take a very serious look at it. My hope is that if uh, monographs do go the route of open access, though as journals already have begun to do on a large scale, it will be done with full funding so that we do not have to suffer the indignities that come with green OA. And the indignities I mean stem from the public availability of unedited, though peer-reviewed manuscripts on institutional personal websites. Most people cheered when Harvard announced its plan to have the journal articles of its faculty in the arts and sciences posted online. Well, I groaned. As a former copy editor who used to edit some Harvard faculty writings, it did not come as happy news to think that these scholars would be willing to have their work appear. Grammatical infelicities, incorrect citations, clumsy prose and all for all the world to see. And it amazed me to hear Harvard administrators speak as though this would be for the public benefit and would enhance Harvard's reputation all the more. Au contraire, I thought to myself, what better way to take the bloom off the rose than to expose the bugs inhabiting the plant, which are only only exterminated when the unsung heroes of publishing our copy editors do their work of restoration. Harvard's website has just recently been opened to the public and I am both anxious and fearful at what I will find when I take my copy editor's eye into its interior. Will I find, as I did as a copy editor, that the expert on a famous religious figure will have systematically miscited the standard edition of his works? Or that the authority on a 19th century political philosopher will have badly transcribed quotation after quotation? or that so few really understand what a dangling modifier is. As much as I am fundamentally in favor of open access, I wish we can avoid the proliferation of versions of the same work, which is what is happening now in journal publishing, with many publishers, including our press, reluctantly agreeing to green OA just because we feel we cannot stand in the way of progress. But at what cost progress? Thank you. <laughs>